Kwatu Barata Nikto. Welcome to the Close Enough Podcast. Have you been summoning demons again? No. Yes. Well, stop. <sighs> Fine. Welcome to this week's Close Enough Podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Jay. Thank you for joining us today. Mike, why don't you get us started off? What are you drinking today? Uh, this week I'm actually drinking a jack-o'-lantern. This is a drink kind of in honor of Halloween coming up this weekend. Uh, when I was looking into the drink, I found several recipes for this. The recipe I'm drinking consists of one ounce Jack Daniels, one and a half ounces of orange juice, half ounce of ginger ale, and a half ounce of Grand Imperial orange liqueur. I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the mixed drinks when it comes to my whiskey, but this is a... Uh, pretty tasty some of the other ones that i looked up one that didn't even involve jack daniels at all which i thought was strange being it's called a jack-o'-lantern includes one ounce of hennessy one and a half ounces of orange juice half ounce of ginger ale one and a half ounces of grand manier orange liqueur and an orange wheel and lime twist for garnish interesting thing about this one if you do the garnish properly it looks like a pumpkin drink tastes nothing like pumpkin whatsoever well that's good seeing as everything around this time tastes like fucking pumpkin another interesting one that i found does include jack daniels um this includes one orange wheel seven mint leaves two ounces of jack daniels whiskey one and a half ounces of simple syrup one and a half ounces of lemon juice half ounce of chambord and an orange wheel for garnish that sounds horrible it looks like you made the right choice not just the idea of the mint leaves with the orange the simplest i don't know that that does not sound good to me at all but to get just a half ounce of shampoo i'm looking at another six dollars just to add into one drink yeah this morning i brushed my teeth and then i drank some orange juice it was awful probably around the same feeling except that you're going to be burning in your chest afterwards as well oh well that's better so jay tell me what are we thinking this week well mike i've been thinking a lot about school shootings lately as you know, this past Friday we've experienced yet another school shooting, this time in Washington State. A student walked into his high school's cafeteria and shot five of his friends in the head before turning the gun on himself. One of the students was killed on the scene, another later died in the hospital. This marks the 26th school shooting in the United States since the beginning of the year. It's kind of a problem. And yet, every part of the media still acts like we've never seen this before. No, you're absolutely right, Mike. It, it seems to be the issue that uh, nobody seems to remember them for more than the first couple of weeks. They they, they feign uh, shock. This is entirely unimaginable, frightening, uh, unthinkable crime. And they seem to forget that we live in the only country in the world where this sort of thing happens all the time. One of the things that gets me, and it's still going on with every single school shooting now, the media is automatically saying that it has something to do with their music, or their movies, or their video games. Well, yes, of course, everybody's going to want to find the easy answer, as though there's one root cause that's going to take care of everything, and once they find it, this problem will be done with the once and for all, as though it isn't an ongoing 300-year problem. You know, it, it's movies, it's violent video games, it's it's music, you know, it's it's no God in the schools. Just put God back in and everything will be fine. And, and you know, from the other side, it's, oh, it's it's just, it's guns. It's the, everybody's got guns. And I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and pin all of the blame on guns. Well, I hope not. I mean, we're both gun owners. Yeah, we're both gun owners, but I'd like to think that uh, neither one of us is an idiot. That's where I think the difference comes into play. Oh, you do think one of us is an idiot? No. I, <laughs> I think that that's Which one? coming into play as far as these people, these kids that are doing it, the parents aren't locking up their guns, or, you know, this kid has depression and nobody's paying attention. But then again, nowadays, what kid doesn't have depression? Everybody's oh. got issues. Everybody's got bullies, or I'm not pretty enough, or I can't get this girl, or my grades suck, my parents yell. I mean, that's been going on throughout all of history though yeah it has but i was under the impression that that's what high school was how many people turned you down in high school oh good lord man i couldn't even remember to count most of them hmm. mine uh, mine's much simpler all of them all of them did <laughs> i've i've yet to shoot up a school though it, yeah no i don't know that the thoughts crossed my mind 
Uh, although I have gotten a little sidetracked off the point I was trying to make. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to step back a bit, if I may. Okay. Uh, the fact is, this child, who was uh, 14, I believe, 14 or 15, had access to a gun, and that, that should never happen. The, the the weapon used in the shooting was legally purchased, registered in the state. Uh, police didn't specify who owned it. I believe it was a relative. Uh, the fact of the matter is that gun should have been locked up and that child should not have had access to it. As a responsible gun owner, it is your job to make sure that your weapon is secured at all times. You are responsible for everything that happens with it. I myself own a rifle. It's in the other room right now, locked up in a case where it belongs. I've got one as well. It's still uh, locked up safe and sound. Well, well yeah, because, again, you're not an idiot. But I think what it really boils down to, it's not just the availability of guns or people breaking up with people or depression or movies or music or, or, or violent video games, comic books, lack of God, uh, satanic influences, sunspots, Ritalin, or any of the other nonsense arguments that people are putting forth. Really, what it boils down to is, is a complex mix of all things and a healthy dose of, I would say, parental disinterest. If you want your child to not turn into a psychopath or a spree killer, spend some time with them. Pay attention to what they're doing. Don't give them the opportunity to slip into the fringes of society. Take an interest. That is your job. And if you guys could stop looking for excuses elsewhere and actually take the time to do that job, Maybe the rest of us could go a week or two without having to hear about another school shooting. This episode of Close Enough is brought to you by A Clockwork Garage. Clocks, keychains, and more made from recycled auto parts. Visit aclockworkgarage.com. This brings us to our next segment, which is our movie review. Last week, we asked for movie suggestions, and you guys really came through. You sent in quite a few of them, and there were some good ones. And there was Rubber, which was a clear, clear winner. A lot of you wanted to see us review this, so we uh, we did as we were told, and we reviewed Rubber. Well, I mean, I watched it a couple times. I watched the beginning of it a few times, fell asleep a couple times, finally got all the way through it. Basically, Rubber is the story of an anthropomorphic tire named Robert, who digs himself out of the desert, rolls around blowing things up, then chases a woman in a Volkswagen Cabriolet into a small town where it kills everybody. All the while, a bunch of people watch from a clifftop. That, that's really about all that happened in the film. Yeah, for, for the most part. I mean, I've got to go ahead and be honest. Uh, not one of my favorite movies of all time, but it was definitely an interesting watch to see for once. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say it was, it was an interesting experience. Experience is a good way to put it. This movie did not bring out any horror to me. Well, it was it was billed as a comedy horror. It, comedy horror. I will admit it had some comedy comedic parts to it. Where there were definitely parts that I laughed at. I enjoyed some of the the outrageousness in the killing. The the obvious dummies. Yeah, pretty much. The cheesiness. The the bad blood splatter. The eating turkey, the the guy in the wheelchair kind of helped make the movie. The only person with any sense in the film? Yeah, of course. You needed to have him. The only person who ever called the film out on its bullshit? Yeah, pretty much. But he didn't want it to end. He said he, he, he had to, to know see it. how it ended. He wanted to know how it ended, as opposed to him ending. Sorry. I'd like to know how it ended. Well, there was a tricycle. So the Just... first question I have for you, how many minutes until nudity? 27. 27 minutes? 27 minutes to full bactal nudity. For a whole second and a half. And it really wasn't that great. Highlight of the film. Easily the highlight of the film. Yeah. You know what, let's start from the beginning. The monologue? Yes. This cop comes in, in the trunk of a car, and comes out explaining, which you figure out is to the group of people that are watching all this happen, that this movie is an homage to no reason. I I'd actually I want to stop you right there because I I have to I have to apologize to Josh Whedon and to Cabin in the Woods because while that was as you so uh, 
eloquently and numerously said, an homage. He didn't come out and fucking say it. He was at least a little bit subtle about it. To start your film off saying, this is an homage to no reason, is basically saying, I'm going to do a bunch of shit, and none of it's going to make any sense, and if you call me on it, I'm going to say, no reason. It was basically, and now for something completely different, done wrong. And that pretty much sums up the movie right there. But right now we've got this group of people sitting up in the mountains, staring at nothing, until slowly a tire comes to life and figures out how to roll itself, and then slowly evolves to figuring out that it can crush a water bottle, and then crush a can. I'd like to know why it took the tire so long to figure out how to roll. That's what tires do. That was going to be my first question. It's pretty much all they do. But again, if you ask any questions, no reason. Then it attempts to roll over a glass bottle, which it blows up with its... What would you call that? Because, you know, normally in a movie, if it's a person figuring out how to blow something up like that or destroy things, it was you would say your mind. It's a tire. It does not have a mind. If that's your biggest gripe about this film, I envy you. No, just my biggest gripe about the beginning of the film. If that's your biggest gripe about the beginning of the film, I envy you. <laughs> they they made a point over it. it was, oh, it's got tele, telepathic powers. And the other, oh, it's telekinetic. and Oh, it's fucking stupid is what it is. Mm-hmm. So it's able to control electricity, it appears. Mm -hmm. It shut down the uh, Volkswagen. And blow a rabbit up with its mind. And a eventually crow. figures out that it can blow people up. It's the, the guy in the truck. Yes. That hit it. Why did she flip him off as she drove by? Hey, asshole, thanks for not hitting me. No reason, I guess. No reason whatsoever. No reason. She just kept driving. Now, let me jump ahead a little bit here to the turkey dinner. Everybody just devours this as if they have not eaten in days. Well, they hadn't eaten in days. They hadn't eaten in a day, I guess. I was going to say, at this point, I thought it had only been maybe two hours. No, they slept. They had, they had spent the night already. It all kind of runs together in my head. I'm having a hard time picking pieces for this movie. The movie did have problems with pacing. You, you see one scene, and then I, I guess the next scene takes place 30 seconds later, but yeah. it doesn't really makes sense somehow what is it two hours later it follows something down the road it the pacing was pretty bad probably the biggest aspect of the film is its length uh about an hour longer than it needs to be it was an hour and 28 minutes i believe 85 minutes total 80, so. 80, hour and 15 hour yeah yeah so yeah it's about, about an hour longer than it needed to be we could uh we could probably lose the the monologue in the beginning we could lose uh, we could lose everything with the bystanders. Uh, and we could, I think we could lose everything with the, the boy and the motel owner. Uh, I think we can get rid of everything with the cop. We could probably lose the ending. I just I want to get rid of the tire as well. You want to get rid of the tire? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that would make it a good movie. I think so. I have to admit, though, the, the part with the cop where he gets shot and he just keeps acting, oh, no, I'm fine. I thought that was funny. See, that was one of the things that made me laugh, even though I knew it was completely ridiculous. It was amusing, but, and, and I know the answer is going to be no reason. The the woman whose head, the cleaning lady, uh, her head was blown off by Robert in the tire. She was in the body bag. Mm -hmm. He comes out, it's, oh, yeah, everything's done. You can all go home. Everything's fine. Nope, she's still dead because somebody's still watching. Why then was he okay being shot in the chest? The indication was that Everything would be fine now that no one's watching. As soon as he found out somebody was watching, the multiple holes through his lungs should have, you know, begun to at least itch a little. What about the uh, the conversation? How many people does it take to figure out whether or not a tire floats or sinks? How many did it take? Well, at that point, I think there was still like six people just Could discussing. Could possibly it. be the best line in the film. Would a tire sink or float? It would sink. We just saw it. There's your answer. The only time this movie starts to make any sense at all is when you stop looking at it as a comedy horror and start looking at it as what it really is, an art film. Oh, God, worst kind. I have to agree with you, though. I spent way too much time trying to figure out how this was a horror comedy, which, slightly comedic, I don't see the horror in it whatsoever. And with it taking 20 minutes for the tire to do something, 
it's it felt like I was watching an old French film. I didn't think about that before. To really understand it, you have to look back at Quentin Dupuis, or however his name is pronounced. Fucking Frenchies. Last film, Steak, didn't do very well. In an interview, he said, Steak is a strange movie. I saw it a few times with an audience, and each time, at least 10 or 15 people left after 20 minutes, which was not really pleasant. One day I arrived late, and the movie was rolling along, but nobody was in the room. I had a shock, like, wow, my movie is alone, and nobody's watching. But it's still running. Well, that's a clue. A clue that you shouldn't make another movie. He decided instead to make a revenge art film. Revenge art film. Yes. In this film, the joke is on you. He believes that he can make you watch any shitty movie, and you'll just lap it up. Nothing makes sense, and nobody questions it. You know, even all of the little non-sequiturs in the film start to make some sense. The empty chairs in the beginning being destroyed by the car are the empty seats in the theater. Interesting. I didn't really think about that, but that makes perfect sense. It's almost as if the audience that's up in the mountains are portraying the different type of moviegoers. You've got the fat, obnoxious guy that shows up late, the girls that won't shut the hell up. Exactly. The, the characters of the, the spectators are how the director views his audience. The contempt he has for them is shown when he poisons them. But the worst part is that the joke is on you, the viewer. Every dollar you spent on this film proves him right. Makes it fortunate that this film lost money. Well, I'm glad that I watched it for free. As I struggled my way through this film, I found myself playing games just to make it through. I tried to look at the cars and figure out when the movie was placed. I put it late 80s, early 90s. I had one myself. I was uh, spending most of the time being I used to work in a garage, staring at the tread pattern on the tire trying to figure out what kind of tire it was. What'd you come up with? I'm pretty sure it's a Dunlop. There's a little uh, squiggle on the side that a lot of the Dunlops would have. Robert was actually performed by three different tires. One of the other things I spent my time was trying to figure out how they did the effects, which most of them were really just a guy off-screen wiggling the tire, or, for some of the more advanced scenes, a remote control car inside the tire. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah, it's practical effects. It doesn't take that much to make a tire roll, because, well, that's what they do. Honestly, I'm at a loss of anything else to say. I'll just go ahead with my rating. I'm be giving this a one... I'll do a one and a half out of your typical five. I'm going to go ahead and give it five stars. Five stars? Well, yeah, out of a out of hundred. Oh. A right. thousand. Okay. I am glad that that is over with. That makes two of us. Well, we've gone ahead and pulled another movie out of the hat from your suggestions. Next week, we will be watching a horror thriller called The Sacrament. So if you haven't seen The Sacrament, go ahead and hop onto Netflix and give that a watch so you can follow along with us next week. Be sure to send in more suggestions and feel free to make them not be horror films. With that being said, this is still Halloween week and I decided I would come in with a couple of uh, horror haunted related stories for you. Oh, what have you got? Well, one of them is Universal Studios here in Orlando. It is said that the Back to the Future ride, which is now the Simpsons ride, mm -hmm. is haunted by two ghosts. Supposedly, two maintenance workers died while repairing the hydraulics on the ride, and they were crushed by the cars. Their ghosts have remained on the ride. Perhaps they're big Back to the Future fans, some people say. Some say that they're just stuck there for whatever reason the ghosts may or may not get stuck in places. But there are some large mirrors on the third floor of this attraction, and no matter how many times the windows are clean, handprints remain on the glass. And on the second floor, whistling can be heard when no one is present. The song being whistled is the same song that the maintenance man who died liked to whistle. Also, large doors at the entrance of the attraction have also been seen opening and closing when the ride has been turned off for the night. Well, I've got to say, if I've got to get stuck somewhere for eternity, the Back to the Future ride is as good a place as any. Uh, sadly enough, it's not Back to the Future anymore. I honestly haven't been there in about 20 years. Well, it's Simpsons now, so if you enjoy Simpsons, you might be uh, happy with that as well. Not sure how your thoughts are on The Simpsons. I'm a big fan, but uh, I guess it's more important how the, me the mechanic thought about The Simpsons. 
good point. I mean, he is one that literally put his heart and soul into the ride. I see what you've done there. Yeah, thank you. Very clever. Another story that was actually sent to me recently uh, involves a house in Illinois where a family gets together every year and they turn their entire house into a haunted house for the neighborhood kids and yeah, I've seen these. There's uh, one going on around here. Uh, they're very popular. Yeah, um, they're all around the country. Well, this particular house apparently was able to make it two weeks with guests still going through without realizing that they had a guest die in one of the rooms and the corpse was found two weeks later by a little girl. I'm sorry, a corpse. Yes. An a, actual corpse. An actual corpse. It uh, doesn't say the reasoning as to the death of the older man, but apparently a younger girl was going through the house and screamed as her children were freaking out, everybody thinking it was just because of the haunt. Little kids got scared. The family was actually like, okay, sure. this is working. Turns out when they leave the house, they said that there was a corpse up in one of the rooms on the second floor, and that was what the children were screaming about. Uh, at this point, the owners are thinking, okay, everything's going good. They go to the second floor trying to figure out, we do not have an old man corpse in our house. What do you do now? Well, in relation to that, the family has decided to shut down the house for the remainder of the season and are planning still to reopen for next year. Well, maybe next year it'll be a real haunted house. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. You love it. Well, Jay, I have heard that you have something for me. I do have something for you. We're going to move on to a game that I'm calling Guess Who. Guess Who is a board game. Uh, really? Yes. All right. It's a game I'm calling, This Guy Didn't Say One of These Things. Look, what do you want from me? I had a good title, and you didn't like it. In this game, I'm going to give you an actor. Then I'm going to give you four quotes from that actor. But one of the quotes is not actually from that actor. Now, question. Are these real-life quotes, or from the movies, or a these little are, bit of both? These are film quotes from, okay. from films that they've been in. All of them are from movies. There's going to be five questions. A total of ten points on offer here. If you can identify the quote that does not belong, I'll give you a point. If you could then tell me what film or what actor said that quote or where it came from, you'll get a second bonus point. Last week, I scored 33%. you got to do better. And if I don't? I'll throw a koosh ball at you. That sounds fantastic. Let's give this a shot. Don't lose on purpose. All right. Okay, we're going to start you off with an easy one here. Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler. I'm a fan. Well, let me rephrase that. Used to be a fan. I've seen some of his film. Okay, so, four quotes here. Ask me if you need them repeated. A. I've never been to Earth. I've never even slept over some other dude's house. B. Please get out of my Van Halen shirt before you jinx the band and they break up. C. Couldn't have done it without the inspiration of my brother, the pool man. And D. I can't run a company. I can't even run my own life. I do know which quote was not from Adam Sandler. Which one was that? C. I could not have done it without the inspiration of my brother, the pool man. Yes. That is correct. What film was that from? I want to say Airheads, actually, but I'm not 100% sure. That will be my guess. That is actually Polly Shore from In the Army Now. In the Army Now. Okay. I remember this. Moving on to our second actor, Robert Downey Jr. Okay. You ready? As ready as I'll ever be. A. Uh, Shakespeare in the Park? Doth Mother know you weareth her drapes? B. You blew the best thing you had going for you. You blew the element of surprise. C. It's a matter of professional integrity. No girl wants to marry a doctor who can't tell if a man is dead or not. Or D. If I miss the birth of my own child, I'm going to choke you out with your own scarf. Wrap that thing around your head and choke you out. Honestly, the only reason I'm going to be able to guess this one is because I know what movie the one came from. Well, what have you got? The Italian Job, B. You are correct on both counts. That is Edward Norton in The Italian Job. I thoroughly enjoyed that movie. That's the only reason I know that. To be honest with you, the rest of those quotes, I couldn't tell you what they came from, but apparently they are Robert Downey Jr. Right now, that is, uh, sorry, that's actually The Avengers was the first one. C was Sherlock Holmes, and D was Due Date. Okay. Well, at this point, you've got three of them. You get one more, you've beat me, and you avoid the koosh ball. And you've got plenty of opportunities. So we're going to move on to something that may be a little bit more your speed. John Cleese. I love some John Cleese. Who doesn't? Are you ready? Let's do this. A. Oh, German! I'm sorry. I thought there was something wrong with you. <laughs> B. Yes, well, it's called the future. 
So get used to it. C. I haven't eaten for nearly 500 years. I don't need to, of course, but one does miss it. And D. Look at them. Bloody Catholics. Filling the bloody world up with bloody people they can't afford to bloody feed. <laughs> it's very difficult to think of some of his quotes, uh, being there's so many from Monty Python. Um, Would you like any repeated? Actually, the last... no, B and D. B. Yes, well, it's called the future, so get used to it. And D. Look at them. Bloody Catholics filling the bloody world up with bloody people they can't afford to bloody feed. Uh, I'm honestly stumped on this one, so I'll take a little stab at it. I'll go with... I'll go with B. B is from James Bond, Die Another Day, where John <sighs> Cleese played Q. That's horrible. I love James Bond. The correct answer was D. Look at them, bloody Catholics, filling the bloody world up with bloody people they can't afford to bloody feed, was Graham Chapman, from The Meaning of Life. Interesting. Yeah. Wait, what, what number was that? That was D. Okay. Which number. is a letter, by the way. It's a letter, yes. <laughs> They only get harder from here. Perhaps you've heard of this man, Robin Williams. Love Robin Williams. I know you do. He's, rest in peace, definitely one of my all-time favorites. Okay, well, let's see how you do on this one here. Are you ready? Yes. A. I forgive people long after they can be punished for their sins. B. You and I share a secret. We know how easy it is to kill someone. That ultimate taboo. C. I'm being toyed with by a bunch of depraved children. Or D. Did I tell you to touch her? If you touch her again, I'll stab you in the heart. Well, I know for a fact two of those quotes are Robin Williams. Well, I know for a fact that three of them are Robin Williams. I know for a fact of two that I know which ones they are. I'm not sure of A or C. Would you like any of them repeated? Go ahead and repeat both those for me. A. I forgive people long after they can be punished for their sins. And C. I'm being toyed with by a bunch of depraved children. I am not 100% sure at all on this question. The fact that he talks about depraved children, though, doesn't ring a bell to me for anything Robin Williams has ever said. So that's going to be my answer, C. You're going to guess C? Do you have any guesses as to where that quit? Oh, good mm -hmm. lord, not even from... remotely. Well, you are correct. That is Michael Douglas in The Game. The Game. I don't even think I've seen that movie. That is a brilliant film. Somebody please suggest that so we can watch it. Okay. Uh, the other one was from The Final Cut. The Final Cut. A oh, fantastic yes. Fantastic film. That is a great... The I know the last one was One Hour Photo. Uh, yes, that was One Hour Photo. The other one was Insomnia. In Insomnia. I was going to say that. Is... All, all, all of those are such great movies. Okay, so you've uh, gotten four correct out of a possible... Eight so far. We're going to move on to the last question. Uh, another actor I, I know you're familiar with. Uh, Jim Carrey. Okay, yes. Coming out with a new movie soon. I'm sure he is. It's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Dick. A. Ring dings and milk? Oh, sure. Then we'll get some balloons and go to a puppet show. B. It was nice to meet you, God. Thank you for the Grand Canyon and good luck with the apocalypse. And oh, by the way, you suck. C. I told you, I don't remember. If you guys are so interested in my sexual failures, why don't you go have a few of your own? Or D. For if knowledge is power, then a god am I. Was that over the top? I can never tell. Well, I know for a fact of what two of them are, because they're two movies that are great. Uh, B is from Bruce Almighty, and D is from Batman Forever, which leaves me with A and C. Can you repeat those again for me, please? A. Ring dings and milk? Oh, sure. Then we'll get some balloons and go to the puppet show. And C. I told you, I don't remember. If you guys are so interested in my sexual failures, why don't you go have a few of your own? Uh, you got me on this one? I have absolutely no idea. I'm going to go with C. You're going to go with C. C is incorrect. C was from Once Bitten. A 1985 Jim Carrey film, and good movie, quite too. a good one for people it that is. Uh, have forgotten about it. It's worth digging up and watching again. It is. A, it's still Halloween. A was Nicolas Cage in Trapped in Paradise. Never seen that movie. Oh, it's a good film. It Yes, it's Nicolas Cage, we know. But it's Nicolas Cage, Dana Carvey, and John Lovitz. Acting! Acting, indeed. There's my John Lovitz, lady and gentlemen. Very good. Well, Mike, looks like uh, out of a possible ten, you've gotten four. 
That's 40%. Just edging out my 33.3, you've avoided the koosh ball. What do I win? Not getting hit with a koosh ball. Oh. I was actually kind of looking forward to the koosh ball. Well, you'll have to suck more in the future. This week's episode of Close Enough is brought to you by AClockworkGarage.com. Our audio technician is Jessica Rabbit. If you've got questions, comments, concerns, movie suggestions, music submissions, or just angry letters, feel free to send them to us at CloseEnoughRadio at gmail.com or contact us on our Facebook fan page, Close Enough Radio. Now we head over to Mike for this week's local band. This week we are featuring an Orlando-based horror punk band. Here is Horror Punks and 21 Dysfunction with Necroviral Frenzy. <laughs> 